facts led the authors to conclude. It is difficult to explain all of the observed immunological differences between patients with severe hemophilia A and those with hemophilia B purely by the transmission of an infectious agent. Evidence exists that all clotting factors are oxidizing agents, the strongest being factor VEE. Factor VEE is a high molecular weight glycoprotein complex, whose subunits are linked by a large number of SS bonds. The SS bonds are required for agglutination activity. Antioxidants induce a dose-related activity decrease of all coagulation factors including factor VEE and X. There are reports which claim that the virus and thus the disease is transmitted via blood-slash-blood products other than clotting factor concentrates. The first and best known appeared to be that of a prematurely born infant who died at 17 months from recurrent infection, and the 18 cases reported to the CDC by August 1983. The authors of the first report, although concluding that the infant developed AIDS as a result of HTLV3 slash lab infection transmitted by multiple blood administration, do not exclude the possibility that he was born with a primary immunodeficiency disorder. More importantly, all blood was irradiated with 30 GI before administration. Radiation is known to produce both immunosuppression and activation of progresses. The 18 cases reported to the CDC and classified as transfusion-associated AIDS via HTLV3 slash lab were diagnosed during approximately a 12-month period when over 3 million Americans received transfusions. Two of the patients most probably had received radiation, chemotherapy or both. These 18 patients were older than other groups with AIDS, 40% were over 60 years of age. 15 of these patients, 83%, received transfusion in association with surgery. Surgery may be immunosuppressive and is known to be associated with infections other than HTLV3 slash lab, the risk increasing with age. More importantly, Grady et al. have shown that an inverse relationship exists between the percentage of T4 cells and the number of units transfused. The above authors conclude, Accordingly, we suggest that studies which purport to show a relationship between the transfusion of blood-slash-blood -blood products and AIDS be viewed with caution. What is now reported as AIDS in a very small proportion of hemophiliacs receiving coagulation therapy and recipients of transfused blood is only manifested as opportunistic infection. Cases appearing before 1981 would not have been identified as AIDS. Since tissues of AIDS patients in general are likely to be abnormally highly oxidized, clotting and blood factors from these patients can be expected to contain more SS bonds and therefore be even more immunosuppressive. Heating the agglutination factors to inactivate a supposed AIDS virus will, in fact, break at least part of the SS bonds and thus decrease both their immunosuppressive activity and therapeutic effectiveness. Immunological and clinical abnormalities similar to those seen in AIDS have been reported in drug abusers as far back as 1973. The immunological abnormalities include absolute lymphopenia, decreased concentration of M and IG antibodies, and false positive serological tests in as many as 40% of drug users. The clinical abnormalities include lymphadenopathy ranging from benign hyperplasia to malignant lymphoma, other malignancies, fever, night sweats, chills, weight loss, and increased susceptibility to infection. Opiates, like nitrites, are oxidizing agents. They produce their effects by binding to the membrane SH. Their effects can be prevented and reversed by reducing agents. The effectiveness of the reducing agents is directly related to their negative redox potential, EO, according to Gallo the HTLV3 slash lab, and thus AIDS originated in Africa, he bases his hypothesis on. I, the isolation from the lymphocytes of the African green monkey of a retrovirus closely related to HTLV3 slash lab. I, the reported high seropositivity for HTLV infection in Africans. EEE, the finding of HTLV3 slash lab antibodies in Sarah collected from Africans before the recognition of AIDS.
If the diagnosis of AIDS in Haitians via which the HTLV-3 slash lab is supposed to have been transmitted from Africa to America, the virus was isolated in vitro cell pit cultures and the monkeys were healthy and free of AIDS, although some authors claim high seropositivity for HTLV infection in Africans, others find only negative results. Thus why said Al did not find antibodies to HTLVI in 1225 Sera from donors of different African countries, nor did Carpus et al. in Sera from Israeli flushes in which others have reported a 37% positivity. The prevalence of antibodies against the HTLV3 slash lab virus has been reported to vary from 6 to 50% in different African countries yet relatively few AIDS cases have been reported from this continent. It is important to note that the test for HTLV3 slash lab antibodies in Africans are nonspecific and that the reported AIDS cases from this continent seem to correspond geographically to these regions, where anal intercourse is a common practice among heterosexual couples. Equally important is the fact that African Sarah tend to be sticky, which means that antibody tests can give relatively high levels of false positives and some investigators contend that this problem increases with age of the serum. As far as the Haitian connection is concerned, this speculation is based on no data. Furthermore, recent evidence became available which shows that risk factors are present among most patients with AIDS in Haiti. Conclusion there are good reasons to doubt that HTLV3 slash lab can be regarded as the exclusive single variable in the pathogenesis of AIDS. There is therefore a spectrum of possibilities. Either it plays no role at all, is of minor significance, or it contributes significantly, but not exclusively to the disease. Be that as it may, the one major significant variable is the concurrent exposure of the patients to oxidizing agents including sperm, nitrites, opiates and factor VE. If this is true then prevention, and possibly even cure, may be achieved with the use of appropriate antioxidants. Acknowledgements I thank Dr. R.A. Fox, E.R. Skull and all my colleagues for support and stimulating discussions, Dr. J.A. Armstrong, Prof. R.L. Dawkins for valuable conversations, Mrs. C. Quinn and White Town for preparing the manuscript, and the staff of the Royal Perth Hospital Library for their assistance over many years. I particularly thank Prof. J. Papadimitriou, Dr. V. Turner and Mr. B. Headland Thomas for invaluable help and continuous support. This work would not have come to fruition without the urging and encouragement of my husband, Costas Eliopoulos, to whose memory it is dedicated. Historical Note This paper was first prepared in 1985-86 and was twice rejected by Nature, its inclusion in the pages of medical hypotheses was only after the author convincingly argued the lack of evidence for a sexually transmitted epidemic of HIV slash AIDS in Africa. This latter data was later incorporated into a paper published in the World Journal of Microbiology and Biotechnology. This oxidative theory of AIDS pathogenesis, which also explains the genesis of the in vitro phenomena inferred as HIV, grew out of the author's redox theory of cellular functioning, see reference 45. The following predictions of this theory can be urged or have been fulfilled. I. AIDS will remain restricted to the original risk groups. I. AIDS is not infectious. E. HIV slash AIDS patients will be oxidized, that is, have lower amounts of cellular sulfidrol groups than healthy persons. If antioxidants, reducing agents, will decrease or inhibit the production of HIV or the effects of HIV, 